Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the first, uh, latest installment of the monthly Data Diversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing strategies for transitioning to a cloud-first enterprise. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADVanalytics. And as always, we will be sending a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for this series, William McKnight. William is the president of McKnight Consulting Group. He takes corporate information and turns it into a bottom line producing asset. He's worked with major companies worldwide, 15 of the Global 2000, and many others. McKnight Consulting Group focuses on delivering business value and solving business problems, utilizing proven, streamlined approaches in information management. His teams have won several best practice co uh, com competitions for their implementations. He has been helping companies adopt big data solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon, and welcome everyone, and welcome back. I see a lot of familiar names uh, out there and people coming in from all over the world. It's really great to see. Uh, again, this is uh, held monthly at this time, so do come on back and stay with us here. It's basically my random musings about the things I'm seeing in my practice, things I want to share with you, uh, things that uh, in my educational background, uh, really, I'm really compelled to share. And um, today is one of the most important ones, I think. It's strategies for transitioning to a cloud-first enterprise. And this is something that a lot of my clients are going through. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about the cloud. Uh, there's actually a lot of action uh, about the cloud. A lot of companies moving there. Everybody's there to some degree, right? Uh, however, there are an increasing number of cloud, so-called cloud mandates. Of course, there's a lot of wiggle room inside of those mandates down at the practical level, but the idea being that many enterprises are trying to get more and more to the cloud for all the good reasons that, that there are. And today, I'm not going to belabor those reasons. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how to help you once you've made those kinds of decisions in your enterprise. Now, cloud first doesn't mean cloud everything. As a matter of fact, it's hard to find a company that is cloud everything uh, out there. But cloud first means, to me, it means that when you are provisioning new resources, for new applications, new services that you want to develop internally, uh, the cloud comes first. You are highly, highly considering, maybe not selecting it every time, but you are highly considering cloud solutions. It's not, well, now it's time to talk about whether we want to do anything at all in the cloud or not. That ship has sailed in these organizations. And I think that's a good thing. As a matter of fact, I think that uh, cloud is here to stay. I don't think that organizations of the future will be provisioning their own data centers uh, pretty much at all in about five to 10 years. Uh, so um, you have to make decisions uh, as an enterprise. And the way you make those, way, the way the manifestation of those decisions is in where the money goes and where you are spending your, for your resources. Is that in the cloud or is that in your on-premises solutions. I think it's going to skew more towards the cloud. I think leading organizations are already there and many more are going to be coming on. And uh, again, I say, I think this is, uh, this is a good thing. This is one of those things, one of, the, one of the few things that really is required, I think, to be uh, a leading uh, enterprise of the future. Uh, and really leading might even be a strong word, just, just sustaining as an organization of the future, basically the com given the basic comp competitive pressures that will occur to those who remain on premises. Okay, so with all that being said, companies are shifting their focus to or entertaining a notion for a first time use of the cloud. I'm not gonna read everything, but I wanna point out a few things on all my slides. 
And um, I, I find that the time that a lot of companies make the big transition is when the hard on-premises assets are coming to end of, not end of life cycle necessarily, but at least to a uh, time for renewal. So a few months before renewal, I start getting calls from organizations saying that uh, we really want to look at this. We want to look at, is it time to move this or that to the cloud? So that may be happening in your organization. Um, and uh, if so, please be aware, be ready for that. Uh, a few months is, is seldom enough <laughs> to move anything of significance uh, to the cloud. Keep that in mind. So start making your plans early and often. And in terms of the planning, I want to give you a framework for that plan here today. That's my goal of the next uh, half hour or so is to give you that framework of how to plan, mostly from a, not from a detailed technical level, mostly from a managerial level. And so a lot of, uh, you know, managers, maybe they're not technicians, but, they, you know, they'll come to me and ask me about how they can steer the organization successfully towards the cloud. And this is the premise of that discussion that we have. And really, it's a more, more or less an elongated engagement because any one of these things, I'm going to give you a few here, uh, could, be, uh, could be enormous in your organization. And uh, as a matter of fact, while I'm thinking about it, I think it actually takes a little bit more maturity as an organization to go to the cloud than to continue to do things on premises, which may be surprising, a surprising statement to say or hear. But this just means that some of those maturity factors are some of the early stage fa uh, activities that must occur in that path to cloud. It doesn't mean, oops, we're not mature, we're not going to move to the cloud. I, don't, I wouldn't encounter any organization that, that I think I would say, no, you can't go to the cloud. You're not ready uh, and forget about it uh, unless you're just kind of writing it out. Uh, I'm speaking to organizations here today that are not just writing out the next few years, but really intend to be around in 5 to 10, 15, 20 years uh, doing uh, more of the same and more new and great things that they do. So some of the decision points around the cloud are here. The software model, you have to understand it. It's different. The pricing is different. The access to resources is different. The provisioning is different. The elasticity and all that. I'll go through this, but it's different. D development and quality assurance, what about that? Let's not leave that behind. That's pretty important. And as a matter of fact, those may be gateways to full on being in the cloud is to do some of that kind of activity uh, in the cloud. We'll discuss. Recovery from outage and credit for downtime. Yeah, that's different. Uh, you can't just have uh, you know, internal, um, you know, challenges, performance reviews, et cetera, whatever you have today for your on-prem, uh, whoops, that shouldn't have bounced, uh, whatever you do for your on-prem outages uh, when you move to the cloud, it's different. Uh, your recourse is through the cloud provider themselves. And so we'll talk about that. So you need to know some things about that. Capacity planning and growth, that's different. Now, when you move from on-prem to the cloud, your need for capacity planning and growth diminishes in a lot of ways. It doesn't go away because you're still picking your resource levels from many of these or these uh, services that you're going to be picking. So it doesn't completely go away. As a matter of fact, just knowing the size of the bread box going into a new application is actually pretty important in making sure that you develop it correctly. So anyway, security and privacy. Uh, this is probably number one in terms of the conversations, in terms of the, the holdback, if you will, from moving to the cloud. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, disaster recovery uh, is another of the gateway drugs uh, to full-on being in the cloud. Uh, it's a good way to start. For some people, uh, they do it the exact reverse. As a matter of fact, if you think of, if you think of a scenario uh, out there of uh, hybrid cloud, okay, hybrid cloud, some things on, on cloud, some things on-prem. Um, if you think of a scenario, it's, it's actually happening out there for sure. For sure another organization is doing it that way. And it's all, all going to be in the execution uh, from that point forward into whatever plan that you make. So there's not a right and wrong here, but there are some things that will get you there faster. We'll go through all that. Disaster recovery might be one of them. Query performance and service levels. People worry about the performance of queries. 
the service levels of the databases with the data in, uh, how's that going to uh, respond to my users, that's a big deal. And uh, I'll give you some hints when we get there. Data interchange in the cloud, similarly, uh, if you're going to be moving data down, moving data up on a frequent basis for various things, uh, there may be some cost to pay for that. So you have to take that into consideration. A lot of people get into the cloud because they don't have to pay for resources that they're not using. And that sounds good on the surface, doesn't it? And I think it is good, don't get me wrong. But if you're just overpaying or paying a very high price for it when you are using it and it all kind of nets out to be more, uh, then you, you haven't gained anything. Now, I'm not saying that's the case with most cloud implementations, but I can say definitively that if you don't architect well for the cloud, um, you will not gain the advantages and you actually possibly will be paying more for it. For example, compressing backups is, is a way to save, oh, 20, 25% of the cost of doing the backup. And that's just one thing. Uh, there are many tips that you're going to need to know to to fully realize the benefits. And I also find that organizations that are, are not doing one of the 10 things, you know, the compressing the backups, let's say, are not doing one of those things, uh, they're pro probably not doing the others as well. They haven't stepped up. They've uh, locked and loaded uh, their uh, on-prem to cloud, and that may or may not have been appropriate, and they're not getting the benefits of the cloud. So you don't want to go into it without that kind of knowledge. Staffing levels are not zero. What does my staff still do? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, they do a lot is the answer, and there's a lot more for them to do and for a great IT professional to do. So uh, this is another big deal uh, in my work, uh, moving organizations to the cloud. Uh, and I do find that in many organizations, dealing with the people issues is as important as dealing with the technical issues. So. Give you some, I'll give you some tips there. And they fall under the program of organizational change management to bring people along with the move. And let's, uh, let's pick some first targets for the journey, or I should say some next targets, because we're all there to some degree in, in the cloud. So what's next? So I'll help you with that. The software model. Now, just about any software, including databases, and if you've been exposed to me, you know that's my background, that's my passion, is enterprise data. Uh, obviously, a lot of that's going to be stored in databases. So there may be some antidotes here from that world. And I would say, while I'm thinking about it, um, moving to the cloud, as I said before, I think it's one of the key things that's going to define an organization of the future, one of the key things that's going to make an organization viable. I think there's some other key things, treating data as, as a key asset and uh, security. And they all work together, don't they? They all work together. There has to be some great vision over the top of all of this to make sure it is a, a successful, uh, I'll say, journey to the future. Today, several platforms were born in the cloud. A lot of the software we use, Salesforce.com is, is a great example, right? There's no on-prem uh, aspect to it at all, at least that I'm aware of. Um, but others have done a major engineering effort to their on-prem solutions, and they work very well in the cloud. They do get a lot of the benefits of the cloud, the rapid provisioning, the chargeback, the access to a wide variety of resources, uh, the rapid elasticity, of course, and uh, the pay-as-you-go pay kind of an approach. So let's not, let's not say that a, a, a piece of software that was born, let's say, a decade or more ago, previous to the cloud era, uh, is not great in the cloud. It certainly can be. You have to look at the cloud. Now, there are some, you have to look at the factors of the implementation. So, um, what I'm trying to say is that many uh, software, much, much of the software that has been put into cloud does give you the rapid provisioning, does give you the rapid elasticity, does give you access to a wide variety of resources, the chargeback, the service levels, et cetera, that you would expect. And by the way, those things that I'm mentioning, and you, you figure out what it is for you, but those things are absolutely imperative today for any enterprise level uh, application. Whoops, any enterprise level application. So it's not like they are optional. There are a few other things that aren't optional as well, right? You can't have security breaches. All right, these are things that 
whether you say it or not, has to be baked into any implementation of today. There's a lot of, lot of wiggle room there. You might have some wiggle room around performance. Maybe you don't need top tier, you know, millisecond performance out of every query. Okay, uh, I'll grant you that. You know, we'll figure that out. Performance is usually pretty important, but okay. On balance, it, it may not be worth going and spending the 99th percentile for, but some things are and you wanna make sure your platforms have those things embedded. Software comes with a wide array of integration with the cloud from a licensing perspective. And of course, you've all heard of infrastructure as a service, PaaS and SaaS. And usually by now in the evolution of a term like these, I would cease to use it because it's become meaningless, but these still stick. And you can still classify the software out there or the platforms or the infrastructure into their right categories and these are them and i think by now we know a lot of what that means i do a lot of work uh, not so much in the software as a service area but more in the platform as a service or infrastructure as a service areas okay let's talk about development and quality assurance so we're all excited about production and what we're going to do with our production and it's going to go into the cloud but oh yeah there's development quality assurance environments and some of you have uh more environments than that that you have to deal with in the development cycle in your sdlc if you will so what about them for some of you you're going to move them first to the cloud because it's less uh critical and keep your production on premises i can definitely see uh, that as being a great stepping stone to that future of everything in the cloud. For others of you, you're going to say, um, well, I need my, I want to keep my development quality assurance as it is. And it's really production that we want in the cloud. That's what's really important here. That's probably, you know, 90% of the importance of moving to the cloud. So let's move it. Uh, and there's definitely a scenario there for that. If you learn one thing today, it's that there's no one size fits all. You have to think about a lot of things to make the, the best plan for you. And um, I want to plan, whoops, there we go again. I don't know why it's doing that. I want to plan that's actually going to work in an organization because I really believe in uh, a movement to the cloud for you. And I know some of that means that uh, I, as a consultant for this stuff, have to impose my will <laughs> on the situation. But also uh, on the flip side of that, sometimes I have to go with the flow of what's going to work in the environment pick your battles and so forth. You got, you got to have the same mentality as you try to level up your organization into the cloud. Development quality assurance is an area to uh, think about for that. Now let's, let's understand the pricing a little bit. And I'm going to bring in some specific examples from my practice uh, into this part of the equation. And in some, uh, some trial runs of this, uh, the, these were the most important sides for, for a lot of people because it's kind of eye-opening. Um, the first thing I want to impress upon you is the first bullet there. The price performance metric is dollars per query hour. Dollars per query hour, that's right, that's right. It's not dollars per node, it's not dollars per uptime. It's what, what is that database in this case, but what is that database doing uh, during that time and how performant is it? Uh, and I think you can get kind of sideways uh, comparing prices when you're not comparing price performance. And so price performance, really important. Uh, it's a normalized cost of running a workload. Uh, it is calculated by multiplying the rate offered by the cloud platform vendor times the number of computation nodes used in the cluster and by dividing this amount by the aggregate total of the execution time. Sounds like a mouthful. It's really not, not, not a huge deal. I think you get the idea, right? It's uh, how long does it take to run and, and, and what is my bill? What is my bill for running this workload? And so I encourage everybody as they start to move into these cloud data databases uh, and other forms of the cloud, uh, try it out, try it out. It's not like uh, before where it was a huge deal to try things out. Now we're looking, at, we're looking at business users that are looking at an IT situation where to provision a new server on premises is gonna take months and, 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 and heartache and a lot of work uh, versus, uh, you know, 50 cents an hour 
to spin up uh, something on the cloud. So uh, you better be a great IT shop if you want to hold on to that kind of fort, uh, that kind of on-premises fort. Otherwise, you need to be flexible and, and go with the, the cloud uh, options and help them uh, into that and show that you're an asset in that environment. That is the environment that we're going to be working in. So to determine pricing, getting back to the slide, each platform has different options. And I'm speaking here of database platforms as an example. Uh, by the way, uh, maybe it's because of uh, you know, what I specialize in, but this is a lot of what people want to move to the cloud. First, second, and third, it's the data. And once the data gets there, other things can drag along, but let's get that data there. And so we are thinking a, a lot about cloud data bases, like the ones I'm going to be talking about here. As a matter of fact, if you want, you can go watch a re rerun of last month's advanced analytics webinar in which I talked about this subject in more depth, databases versus cloud storage versus Hadoop. Um, and I'll leave it there. Uh, for Azure SQL Data Warehouse, obviously from Microsoft, you pay for compute resources as a function of time. Obviously, this is on Azure only, right? Uh, the hourly rate for SQL Data Warehouse varies slightly by region. Uh, I'm most inclined to go with the closest region. However, based on my experience, uh, I will uh, change that up uh, time to time. Uh, but generally speaking, that's what we do. Also add the separate storage charge to store the data. It's compressed, but you're still storing it at a rate of some number of dollars per terabyte per hour. Uh, I will give you on the next slide, I will give you the links to the various pricing pages where this information is. And you can see that there are some differences across these leading uh, cloud uh, databases that you want to be aware of. By the way, that storage charge is usually quite low in the grand scheme of things. But that's Azure. What about Redshift? You also pay for compute resources, nodes in this case, as a function of time. Redshift also has reserved instance pricing, which can be substantially cheaper than on-demand pricing. It's available with a one or three year commitment and is cheapest when paid in full up front. <laughs> this sounds like, um, like buying uh, many other things that we do uh, that we buy personally. So you have to make those kinds of decisions as well, which whereas before, it was a huge decision that you would make and then live with for quite a while. So this is a little bit different, but there are elements of, of that as well. I mean, the Amazons, the SQL servers, uh, SQL data warehouses of the world and so forth, they do want uh, to know, you know, are you in? Uh, can you commit? And if so, you can get some discounts. Uh, Snowflake, uh, you pay for compute resources as a function of time, just like the other two. Uh, there is uh, one difference, which is that they have some different, um, different flavors uh, of Snowflake that you can choose from, standard Premier Enterprise or Enterprise for Sensitive Data and Virtual Private Snowflake. Uh, the cost for all of them, except for Virtual Private Snowflake, uh, is posted at the pricing page, which is found at the lower part of the slide here. You can check that out. So I think it's the same code base. It's just some features are going to be turned off if you haven't um, if you haven't selected one of the more advanced um, flavors or options. So, uh, for example, in enterprise, I call that multi-cluster because that's the big feature there, and that really helps out uh, concurrency. And uh, maybe that's why it's called enterprise. Uh, that's what an enterprise would go for. And by the way, when you're checking it out, though, if you want to just check it out, um, you can get standard and save a few bucks and check it out. With Google BigQuery, it's a little different. One option is to pay for bytes processed at a certain number of dollars uh, per terabyte. And uh, that's a published number. There's also a BigQuery flat rate, which is published. So that's an all-you-can-eat option. And I understand that many uh, of their customers do avail themselves of that flat rate. Um, you can save, if you're actually really using it, you can save uh, quite a bit. Uh, by going with that, but there's a bigger commitment level there again. So there you go. Uh, so I, without using numbers here, because that would have um, taken us uh, down a path uh, that I didn't want to go to today, without using numbers, those are the simple um, but uh, nuanced ways that, for example, 
the cloud database market prices their wares. So you do have to understand pricing in your move to the cloud. Okay. Recovery from outage and credit for downtime. Now, if this happens, you can't go scream at the system administrators it's because they uh, are not responsible. It's more the Amazons or Microsoft or Oracle or IBM or wherever you have your data that is responsible. However, they give you they give you a service level agreement. This is the famous on this billboard here is the famous Amazon one, and I believe it's pretty recent. Um, and I was probably the one that's up there right now, but. If the annual uptime percentage for a customer drops below, yeah, 99.95% for the service year, that customer is eligible to receive a service credit equal to 10%, blah, blah, blah. So you can get something back. I, I have not in my walk um, come across an organization that has availed themselves of this. Um, of course, we all seem to know about it when AWS goes down. Um, and I guess I've been lucky. Uh, none of my clients have been in that boat. I've heard stories. So I do know it happens, and, but this is your this is your recourse, okay? Um, is it better? Is it a better recourse than what might could happen internally? You know, holding people accountable. Uh, that's hard to say, but this is the recourse. Um, I tend to think uh, it is. It's it's more quantitative. Um, you can factor it into your plans and so on if you want to. Um, you can also look at their, their uptime, and you can see that uh, they, they well exceed this most of the time, this 99.95%. Of course, you may, you may be doing that internally. I don't know. In my experience, though, uh, that's going to, this is going to be better than most internal uh, operations. And going back and across my uh, years of experience, I can uh, remember many times, and I'm sure we all can, have been around a little bit, many times when there was outages and downtime in our on-premise situ situation. I used to run the uh, data, I ran data teams at uh, enterprises and I ran production support. Yes, back in the days of the beeper. Yeah, we would transition the beeper once a week and you would be, if you, had, if you held that hot potato beeper, you would be on call. Uh, yes, that's how it worked. Uh, anyway, moving along from that nostalgia, Safe harbor and cross-border restrictions. Uh, you're going to want to know where your data is today. And for multinational companies, the concern about safe harbor and country border restrictions for data keeps many from going to the cloud. And that's why we see, quote unquote, clouds popping up in various countries around the world. Uh, we see GDPR, and I don't need to belabor that here today. We could spend a whole section uh, or a whole session on GDPR, global data privacy, and this is uh, in the European Union, real quick, real quick here for those who aren't aware, European U Union, and it features the ability of a citizen of the European Union uh, to uh, have their data removed from a company, should they wish to, to do that, without peril to the company, by the way. GDPR has been out for a few months now. Uh, there have been fines, right? Yeah, fines. Uh, that's what it was all about, right? If you violate uh, the restrictions, uh, you will have fines. Uh, there's been over $5 million of fines, something like $5.6 million, but over $5 million of it went to one company. <laughs> that's right, one company, Google. Um, so I would say you can look at that as half full or half empty, meaning uh, you Meaning, yeah, that's it's a it's a healthy number of dollars, but um, mostly it's been small. However, uh, it's there for a reason. We're going to see more of this. We see California now, for example, uh, coming out with something similar to GDPR, and we'll see how that plays out in other countries. Here in the USA, uh, especially for domestic-based companies, um, this may not be as big a worry as uh, for those of you in smaller European countries with obviously customers uh, across borders easily. So this comes into play more there, but uh, everybody needs to know where their data is. Okay, capacity planning and growth. The platform should be able to grow or shrink. The platform should provision only what is needed. Yeah, especially if you're paying by, by the uptime, as you saw before, you will do that. Now, for an enterprise data warehouse that's 
you know, really important. It's 24 by 7 for an ERP system that's 24 by 7. For the myriad of systems in our organization that are 24 by 7, that's not going to factor in that uptime, downtime charge, for example. The platform should provision only what is needed. And by the way, this provisioning, if you really want the benefits of the cloud, and I said it before, rapid elasticity is one of the important benefits of the cloud, and it actually is a must-have uh, today as you go forward into the cloud. You are going to need it if you're in an enterprise. Um, that is just the dynamic of the organization today. So if it takes, it should take minutes to scale up or down and create little disruption for migrating or repartitioning. Otherwise, one of the key benefits of the cloud is lost. It should not take hours. It should not be a big stepping stone. It should be not be like a, oh, I don't know, what's the analogy? I should not have to walk up stairs um, every time that I want to make a change. It should be a very tiny step or something that is maybe a, a, a moving walkway where you're just continually moving forward and you don't even know it. The more proactive and involved a customer has to be in the process of resource determination, the less elastic the solution is. I would prefer not to have to talk to Amazon when it when I get a uh, when it when it moves when when the cluster gets bigger or smaller. I prefer not to get on the phone. I prefer not for it to be a, a war room, for to, it to be a big meeting or a big deal. And truly, it's usually not, and it doesn't have to be. And so that is your goal going in. So set yourself up for that. Now, what about security and privacy? It, this is, this is uh, very related to what I uh, said a couple slides ago about the safe harbor and the cross-border restrictions. But these are the largest areas of concern today with the cloud. You need to do your homework with your security policy. And this, is, uh, this can be quite a bit involved. But one of the things that we start with is what kind of certificates does the provider have? And what kind of certificates are important for you in your industry? Uh, there are those in telecom, healthcare, government, obviously financial, et cetera. So uh, that takes you a certain way down the path of comfort uh, with the vendor, but there's obviously more uh, to it than that. And just as a breach can occur in your data center, it can also occur at cloud hosting data centers. Yeah, it can occur. Obviously, breaches uh, can and do occur at AWS, Azure, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to be prepared to deal with it. And your customers largely will be uncaring that it's their fault versus your fault. Okay, so you have to be prepared to deal with it as if it were on premises. And once again, we're bouncing the slides here. Okay, disaster recovery. I alluded to this before. So let me go into it a little bit more here. Um, it's something that is uh, of digestible cost. Usually it's just going to sit there. It's going to receive data on a regular basis and sit there. There is room to scale, and it's a good fit for dual purpose. And it's practically maintenance free. So when I have an organization that's really struggling to move anything of significance to the cloud, and I'm not getting anywhere, uh, this is one place that I'll go. Uh, to help start that transition. And I believe that the first step, uh, that, that the first step is the hardest. And uh, you, you will see this throughout my consulting work and so on, where I'll encourage somebody to, well, you know, what would be the first thing that you would do if you wanted to, you know, get this report done? Would you, you know, start a Word file and maybe put a heading on it? Okay, let's do that. And things start to naturally flow from that. And this is disaster recovery for you. Um, not that disaster recovery on the face of it isn't important, it certainly is. But it's a great place for, um, it's a great place uh, for your data. And maybe you want to put your data in, for example, external tables like S3. Keep in mind that those databases that I just talked to you about, they can use S3 as external storage. And not that this would be relevant for disaster recovery necessarily, but that those tables can be in Parquet, in ORC, in CSV, in Avro, in all kinds of formats. And so one way to save money, getting back to that, uh, in the cloud is 
to put the the colder data out there on S3 and to uh, just attach to that as external tables. You can be doing other things with that data uh, on S3 if you want. And I keep using S3 as an example, but maybe it's a bad example, but there are other cloud storage options out there for you. Uh, clearly Azure has a different one. Clearly Google has a different one, but my point is cloud storage. Now query performance and service levels. Uh, cloud query performance will depend upon the same factors as on-premise query performance. You can't just, I mean, you don't, how do I say this? Um, I really want to impress upon you that, and, and I said this a little bit earlier, you can't just drop anything in the cloud and expect it to you know, perform. You have to not only tune it for the cloud, but it has to be well tuned on the face of it to begin with. Some people asked, me uh, the question I think it was last week uh, does our data have to be in a dimensional model well ha let's talk about what you mean by have to be have to be in a dimensional model no it will function if you put it there for ad hoc analysis in a normalized excuse me model it will function will it perform to the best um, that will depend upon many things some things that have to do with the cloud uh, but other things have to do with the design of the data model. And dimensional, in my view, is the best for interactive access. So you probably will want to. Um, do you have to? Do you have to go through the, oh, I don't know, few hundred hours of uh, person time to redo the model? Eh. Well, that, there's a cost associated with that and so forth. Uh, generally speaking, though, uh, you probably you want to keep to all those great design standards that you have for your analytic and your operational environments when you move to the cloud to get the best query performance and service levels. And we're coming upon data interchange in the cloud. As, and this is probably the thing I want to impress upon you about this, which is uh, something to do with the best laid plans. <laughs> um, I think a lot of times uh, we, we design our applications uh, that such that we think they're going to be all in, all encompassing and uh, self-contained, self-contained. And then we get to points in the application development process where we look around and we see John over there seems to have uh, developed uh, uh, something that we could use. And either I could rebuild that or I could use that. Hmm, maybe I need an SLA to what he's doing. And that's where, that's where leadership can really step in and, and help out and ensure that this happens. Ensure that they're sharing, ensure that you're building for sharing in the first place. You want to build your applications for the cloud for sharing in the first place, meaning that uh, knowing that you may not foresee the details, but knowing that there will be interchange back to on-premises for certain things, and there will be non-standard, meaning not the, just the nightly batch update, uh, not the trickle feed, but there'll be other things that you'll want to push up there. And you want to be aware of the cost of that and the cost of loading the data. And some of the databases I talked about, like Google Cloud, uh, there's no charge for loading the data. They, they get it all on, on the query side of things. So that's OK. But there's still time involved and work involved in doing that. So you want to be prepared for that. I definitely wanted to spend some time or leave some time and leave some impressions upon you about staff because these are still sort of relevant things. Uh, what is the escalation for production failures in the middle of the night? Now, the hardware going down, probably that's not going to happen or be in your control, uh, or in, in your purview, but the applications, surely, surely it can go down. Google didn't write your application. Amazon didn't write your application, you wrote it. So that's coming back to you. So what about that? Is that still a thing? And does everybody have access to do what they might need to do? And middle of the night is sort of proverbial uh, these days when a lot of things are 24 by 7. So I really mean any, any time. Who will manage hardware and software patching? Just make sure the vendor should be doing this. The cloud vendor should be doing this. Just make sure it's going to be done. Understand the philosophy that they are undertaking to do it. Is it as soon as it drops? Or is it after they've tested it? or is it after it's been out a while, okay? Um, a lot of times you can't affect, you can't change that. But knowing that will come in handy 
when you're talking to your vendor and they said, oh, well, we just put that bug fix out there last week, or you know, that's, that feature is dropping next week. You'll know you won't be getting it for three weeks or you're gonna get it uh, as, soon as, the, uh, as soon as the album drops, it's gonna come into your iTunes. You know, you're gonna figure that out, figure that out. How will we make the call or expend the budget for additional whatever as the implementation grows? So um, you're gonna get a monthly bill from these guys, okay? It's go but you can watch it daily if you want. Uh, and you can report on it internally daily if you want. I have clients that do this, that keep a close eye on it. And by the way, um, this brings up a point that I wanna share back, which is you can't be looking for ROI in every little thing. You have to have made the big, the big uh, hairy statement about moving to the cloud and then the things will fill in. And on a day-by-day -day basis, there's, there can't be ROI expected on the day-by-day -day decisions if they are progressive towards meeting the bigger challenge, which is moving to the cloud, okay? Now, the roles in, for the staff depends upon the piece of code, software as a service, the user company owns, who, oops, keeps bouncing on me, who can have access to the software for platform as a service, since the vendor is responsible for the infrastructure, you need to design with those parameters in mind. For infrastructure as a service, there's much more responsibility back on you, including managing the network, the servers, the disks, the patching, encryptions, backups, logging, building redundancy, et cetera, what have you. So no free lunch here, but there are some better lunches than others uh, in terms of the workload. So it's all about a big balancing act, as I like to say, a big leadership act. Organizational change management. This is very important. I only have one slide on it, but this is, um, this is the program to bring the staff along with this move to the cloud. I get pushback um, a lot on the progress that I want enterprises to make, uh, the time frames, the, the uh, I guess the urgency factor uh, of what I feel uh, is important to a, to a client. You may too, you may too, uh, but you need to bring other people along to some degree. I believe that given the chance, most people will come along with the move despite sticking their um, stick in the ground uh, and, and, dragging, <laughs> and dragging things out and uh, just being the uh, proverbial stick in the mud in terms of this move to the cloud. It happens, they're great people. I feel like they'll mostly come along. Um, if this is going to happen, if the move to the cloud is going to happen, if that person's not going to stop it, then it's in their best interest to get on board and it's in everybody's best interest, I think, to help them get on board. So I really am passionate about this, uh, helping people come along with these big moves. Um, they may hate me at first. <laughs> they may hate you at first, but it's about the move. It's about uh, really a career enhancing move. It's about the future. It's about being part of that future, that inevitable future. Do you believe that? If you're moving to the cloud, you must believe that it's inevitable. I certainly do. And, uh, and so I think it's in everybody's best interest to, uh, to get on board. So it's a big change. People, um, it's, a, it's the biggest change in our career as, as you know, technology professionals of a certain age, okay? It's the biggest change in our career of this on-prem, everything on-prem to eventually everything in the cloud. Stakeholders of the cloud move come from various parts of the organization and beyond. Job roles will change. Stakeholders must be trained to behave differently. Communications around status and dates are essential as well. Your cloud moves must have a focus beyond technology and address these people-related risks. Now, a program of organizational change management includes things like Stakeholder analysis includes things like changing job roles, includes things like organizational readiness, okay, training, death side training potentially. Um, but there has to be some teeth behind the move, but it has to be done in the right way. And this is where leadership comes into play. Anybody can, can come here and give you the ABCs of this stuff, but Implementation is longer than it takes me to read a slide. Implementation of this is multi-months potentially. Uh, when you're talking about organizational change management, it could take uh, potentially quarters to get the 
organization on board with such a move. And in my uh, experience, a lot of times it's it's uh, people in IT roles that are the ones that hold that are the holdbacks on moving to the cloud, as well as agile, as well as other things, big data, etc. Uh, and that's okay. It has to come from somewhere. We just have to be ready uh, to deal with that and enhance these people's careers, help them be successful in this new world, and help them, uh, you know, become assets to this uh, program. Okay, I've said enough. Bandwidth. Finally, you know, th this is something that doesn't have anything. Well, doesn't have a lot to do with the cloud provider. We can talk all we want about the benefits of the cloud. We can talk all we want about performance of queries and performance of moving uh, data up and down. But one critical factor resides squarely on our organizational shoulders, and that's bandwidth. And I'm not, uh, I'm not the one to, uh, I'm not a network administrator or consultant, all right, but they are important in this process. The cloud can get a good or bad reputation based on this factor. And with cloud acceptance, you naturally stop drinking your data out of a tiny straw. If that's what you have, you're going to have to work on that and fix that uh, first. It's well worth it. It's not a knockout factor. A lot of people come across factors like this. Oh, we're not ready. Oh, so-and-so says, says the cloud is not secure. Um, our bandwidth is not good. Okay, those are things to be fixed. That's your phase zero of your program. Just b build it right in. Um, it's, 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 a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm tasked with moving to the cloud. So, you know, set the table for me. Make sure everything is ready, and then, I'll, then, I'll, then I'm able to step in and do my job. Well, your job is to pick up the ball wherever it is, however the organization looks today, and make it happen, moving that forward. And, and this is where I keep coming back to that word leadership. You might have to get involved in things that you're not, really not, you're not, you're not trained in. I'm not trained in network administration. I've learned enough to be dangerous and to... Uh, I guess, uh, steer that ship a little bit uh, to make sure that the rest of this program is going to work. And that's what you may need to become as well. So don't shy away from that. Keep the end goal in mind. That's your goal. So let's pick some next targets for the journey, all right? Uh, the right amount of criticality. It can't be something with uh, that's a nothing burger that's not really going to do anything. Pick a manageable problem that you can solve. Consider technical integration points of the application with the legacy environment. So if there's a lot, of, a lot of interchange points, those can take up the complexity and the time and the cost exponentially. So you want to find things that are somewhat uh, isolated. Have a strong executive sponsor, one who puts clout behind the project, yet understands perfection is not possible. Not someone that's going to chop your head off at the first uh, sign of uh, something going wrong. Something will go wrong. Um, hopefully it's nothing big. Uh, but that's all part of the journey. If you're not making small mistakes, you're not moving fast enough. All right. Get help. Get experience. Uh, get some people in that have done this before, that have had similar journeys. Uh, and uh, don't, uh, don't necessarily um, make sure that it's, it's all been, you know, 100% successful journey. Uh, it is it, great for them to have gone through some trials and tribulations. Uh, already. And, um, and remember, we're all kind of new to this, so uh, take that for what it's worth. Now, there's more maturity in moving to the cloud imperfectly than in merely perfectly defining the shortcomings of the cloud. So let's not stay on the outside of this issue. Let's get on the inside of it, especially for those companies out there that have that cloud mandate. Let's put some teeth behind it. Let's put some definition behind it. Build internal credibility in the team. This is going to give you the ability as the leader of the cloud movement, whatever it is, maybe you're leading the organization, maybe you're leading a department, maybe you're leading an application, maybe you're leading data or a piece of data or a piece of software, okay, whatever it is, that, that leadership. The org you build credibility so, you, so that the organization will defer to you and you, you do have it in there, you do have the enterprise um, needs in good hands, right? That's you. You do have the enterprise needs in mind, right? The organization must know it's well taken care of, and this is the team that will do that, your team. Don't talk yourself out of starting. Uh, I, I belabor this a little bit. Uh, remember remember uh, the term phase zero. When you're encountering things out there, 
that would hold you back um, because you didn't think about them or they're not in your purview. Just remember, William said phase zero. That is part of my purview because I have this goal in mind. Whoops. Success is not perfection. You cannot accurately predict activities for two to three months out, like in detail, okay? Let alone six to nine months, however long it takes. Get started. That resistance to the cloud is not about being there. You've already decided you want to be there, okay? Let's get there. But it's not about being there. It's the path. It's, it's, it's the right team in place. Is there ample communication? And, of course, all of the 10 factors or, or however many factors I went over today are all of those taken care of. That will smooth your transition to the cloud. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Shannon for any questions that we may have while you look at this slide and uh, see that we're going to be back here the second Thursday of next month and every month thereafter. William, thank you so much for this great presentation as always. Just love it. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will be sending a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session. Uh, so diving in, if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner in the Q&A section, although I see some questions have come in. Um, so uh, you talked about this a little bit. Well, what would be the basis for choosing a multi-cloud strategy? Well, um, the basis that I hear the most about this is to hedge your bets um, and so you're not completely captive to one of the cloud providers. What I haven't heard a lot of is that I want to go here, I want to go here to Azure because they have things that, that aren't over here in AWS, although that is, that is somewhat true. Um, I think it should be more true. In, in other words, I, like I'm in the database space as most people are aware. So if I'm looking at, at databases, I want, uh, if I want Azure SQL Data Warehouse in the shop, I want Azure SQL Data Warehouse in the shop because it's going to be the best. Uh, well, it's only available in Azure and we're an AWS shop. I think there, there's a conversation there to open that door uh, to having multi-cloud just right there. If that, is the, if that is the best, and I'm not saying it's the best every time, but if that is the best for that given situation. And uh, William, are you able to speak on Fed uh, RAMP ramp, Fed ramp compliance? I am not. Okay, I, it's very pretty specific, but uh, I'm certainly I'm sure we can find some stuff on that. Um, and as we're diving in here currently a little bit further, um, do you have a strategy, uh, a surgery? Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to. Uh, I have had uh, surgeries. Yes, I have. <laughs> well, that, that, that's, that's actually it says. Um, <laughs> uh, D for strategy, uh, straight uh, or give tablet first and keep monitoring when it comes to resource allocation in the cloud, including bandwidth. Can you come again with that? I'm sorry. There's I'm trying to. I think there's. Uh, so do you. Um, do you for do you come straight away for one uh, uh actually let me just ask the questioner if you can retype that comment and question see if we can get that um in there so let me jump to the next question here so will the underlying security framework of cloud impact the query performance as well hmm that's a good question um i've done a lot of performance field testing um uh, on these databases, I have not considered that that would impact uh, performance. Um, what I've done is uh, thrown workloads at, at databases, at streaming solutions, at APIs, um, at embedded databases, at data integration tools, uh, et cetera, and uh, seen how they performed. And each one of them obviously comes with a different set of uh, you know, uh, security approaches. And, um, but I can't, I can't say that, uh, I, I want all the security I, I can get, right? Um, and, and that is a, a factor that in, in a selection process could override uh, performance, um, obviously. Uh, and then, you know, make performance a secondary uh, consideration. So um, 
I think the vendors all want to get as many security compliances as possible on that basis. I even if it were to slow down the query, I I cannot see them being connected. I've been a database engineer in the past. I I can't see that uh, as being a major factor in that. Sorry, I'm missing something on that. But. Yeah, no, sure. And and do you consider alternatives to the current software, for example, data lakes and NoSQL and columnar basis to the current on-premise data warehouse solution? Um, well, I see as, as an alternative to the current on-premises data warehouse solution to be a cloud-based uh, data warehouse solution that's also in a relational database, like some of the ones that I mentioned uh, in the presentation. So that is the transition that we're helping organizations to make. But well beyond the, the data warehouse, there are many other platforms that make a ton of sense inside organizations, right? Many other analytical, many other operational systems that make sense. Um, I'm not going to, I, I mean, the, the whole, is NoSQL still relevant? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a whole uh, mouthful there conversation. So I'm not sure that we want to get into that. But uh, a lot of the databases, I will say, have um, absorbed a lot of the functionality that NoSQL databases had, especially early on in terms of being able to deal with JSON data, for example, XML data, some of the other data types. So there are definite alternatives um, in making that, de making that decision. So I would ask um, probably, uh, you know, my top 20 questions, and then we'd get somewhere on that. Sure. Okay. So it really is. So do you go for surgery straight away on the day zero or give tablet first and keep monitoring when it comes to resource allocation in the cloud, including bandwidth? Ah, I get the question now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so surgery was, was a part of it. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, um, I, I don't like surgery uh, for myself or for my uh, my clients, so um, uh, I prefer a, a a more measured approach. But um, you know, some organizations, frankly, they're so far behind that um, that they need to jump some cycles and they need to uh, take some uh, take some big leaps, or they're just not going to be around. Um, they can make the decision to kind of not do anything and and ride it out. And I think people start to become aware that that's that's what you're doing, um, and that's not so fun. Um, or uh, they can be doing things, and sometimes that means swinging for the fences, and a lot of times that means you don't you don't have the right people in place, or n enough people in place, or the right skills in place uh, to to make that happen. So I'm not opposed to it in certain cases. I will say that the way it's come down in many organizations is a little bit more of a measured approach. Uh, but you know, there's a spectrum there. There's a spectrum. There's no one right answer. It depends upon your circumstance, what your goals are, what your industry is doing, and how far ahead or behind you are of that curve and, and what needs to happen. So I, I use a maturity, maturity model, and um, I think this may be a, a future presentation, but um, there's five levels, and I'm telling everybody, everybody, that they need to be at level three if they want to be a sustainable organization and that the levels keep changing. If you've heard me talk in the past year, you've already heard me say stuff like this, but you know, the levels keep changing. You got to level up, up and um, you got to be sprinting to that level three just for sustenance, let alone for market leadership. That's a four or five. So uh, let's talk about, you know, what you, uh, what your goals are, where you are, and that'll dictate how fast we want to move. I love it. Such a good question. <laughs> now that I understood it. <laughs> yeah. It's all in the reading. Um, well, William, thank you so much for this great presentation, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love it. Uh, again, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides and links to the recording. Uh, and and that's about it. That's William, again, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, William. Thanks, Shannon.